So Rosalind Santa Elena. You Elena. got it. Perfect. Yes. Okay. She is a head of RevOps for Clary and has over 20 years experience and was also featured in LinkedIn sales operations leadership group spotlight for September. So she's a big deal towards me <laughs> and Ryan. Um, so before we, so what we'll do is um, Ryan and I will be also monitoring the Q&A in the chat. So if you guys have any questions, please submit them. Uh, we'll get them to them as fast as possible, but let's start this. Uh, Rosalind, can you tell us about yourself and what got you into RevOps? Yeah, absolutely. So, so as you mentioned, I've been doing operations for quite a long time before RevOps, really the terminology RevOps really existed. Um, but just make no mistake that the function itself has always existed, you know, for as long as there's been sales and marketing, um, just sort of what we're calling it, I think has changed, it evolved over time. Um, but I started very early on in my career, actually running sales compensation. So really end to end sales comp was sort of my step into operations. Um, and when I think about um, that journey, it made a lot of sense to broaden into the rest of operations. Because if you think about sales comp, you really touch the entire revenue process, right? From strategy through, you know, how do you secure or acquire leads and prospects and ultimately make them customers um, and then existing or excuse me, expansion and upsell into each customer. So um, I made my transition um, sort of broadening into operations, you know, primarily in sales ops. And then over the years have broadened into marketing operations and then customer success ops when it became customer success ops, as we started moving more into, you know, as businesses started moving into more of a SaaS model and a recurring revenue model. I think the need for that, um, you know, end to end, operation function has grown right significantly. One question I wanted to ask. Um, so you've obviously done every, it seems like you've worn many caps for doing different types of ops. Right. Um, how did, why did revenue ops kind of turn into its own role? Like, cause there was business operations there was sales operations, marketing operations, HR operate, like all these different things came in. How, like what, why do you think the market kind of shifted this way? Yeah, so I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, more and more companies are moving into a recurring model. I think um, a lot of businesses are obviously seeing the value of your customer base, knowing that, you know, customers or buyers are becoming smarter, right? Buyers are smart. They expect a certain level of experience um, in terms of timeliness, you know, just the whole value story, I guess, for a, from a customer perspective. And I think organizations are realizing more and more that, you know, within a company or within your own organization, having sort of these separate silos of marketing versus sales versus renewals versus customer success, sort of these different buckets, um, being able to break down those silos, have everybody speaking the same language, having everybody marching sort of to the same beat um, on the revenue team is really a strategic differentiator, I think, for businesses. So I, I heard you basically once say revenue ops, you look, think about it as an engine. What does that mean? Yeah. And like, how does that differ from like sales ops or marketing ops? And how do they all work together within this construct? Yeah. So I like to think of revenue operations as an engine. And I do use that quite a bit because I really do think of, think of it as sort of the underlying power behind your revenue team. Right. So if you think about you have sellers, you have marketers, and then you have, you know, our renewals folks and customer success folks. But if you think about all of the underlying um, infrastructure that supports the revenue facing teams, that's operations. Right. So if you think about the processes, the systems, and as you both know, our tech, tech stack for sales and marketing has just grown exponentially over the past, I'd say, five years or so, even 10 years. Um, but it's, you know, it's just saturated with amazing products um, and operations has often become the default for managing the tech stack, right? Um, so if you think about the systems, the tech, the processes, the policies, really the cadence, you know, your meeting cadence, your communication cadence, all of the things that really power your revenue teams, that's what I view as rep revenue operations. Um, and obviously the more efficient your engine runs and the more effective your engine runs, the better your business outcomes. So if you're joining, if you're joining this today and you don't have a RevOps team and you're thinking about it, or you're someone that's like, Hey, I kind of do this role, but I don't really know what to define it. Where do you start? Like, yeah. what do you do? 
Yeah, so I think um, even within different organizations, I think the term of rev, you know, what is defined as revenue operations can be different, right? If you ask a lot of companies, just similar to sort of the rise of the CRO title, right? Yeah. You're seeing more and more of the CRO and there's a lot of questions in a lot of companies that CRO is really just your head of sales, right? They may not manage all of the business. They may be a net new focus, but I think we're starting to see more of um, the value of having that CRO really manage the end-to-end revenue process from top of funnel, you know, marketing activity through kind of your end customers. Um, and so the revenue operations role is similar, right? And I think as companies um, start to, you know, if you don't have an operations role and you're thinking about, it, and I actually get this question quite a bit um, because I do have a lot of sales leaders or um, marketing leaders who will say, hey, you know, I do I need operations, right? And how do I go about building it? What do I need? Do I need someone to do everything? Do I need somebody to focus on certain areas? And a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, your size and stage of your company, um, where you're at, how complex your selling motion is, who do you sell to, right? So there's a number of factors, I think, specific to your business that will um, sort of dictate what areas you should focus in on first, right? Because I think one of the primary uh, values of bringing in ops is obviously insights, right? It's the data, the insights, the ability to sort of see, see the see what's happening in your business, the blind spots, right? See around corners and see the things that, you know, as a sales leader, you may not see. Um, so I think to answer your question, I think it really depends on which areas of your business you're most focused on. I think typically in earlier startups, you're obviously the, the meat of the kind of the middle of the customer journey, the sales piece is usually your, your most, um, I guess, most critical area in the beginning, because you may not have any customers. So you may not need that account management customer success piece. You may not generate a lot of marketing activity and marketing campaigns. So you're pretty much focused on just acquiring prospects, making them a customer and sort of building in that process. So uh, follow-up question for you then. Um, You obviously have to buy tools in your sales stack and marketing stack and have data that you can capture in a way to look at that data. you need billing, you need things that tell you about what's going on with customers that you have already and new customers you're bringing in. You, in order to get any of this stuff first, you, you probably actually need to have like a vision of what revenue operations should be at a company, right? Um, you mentioned data obviously being an important one, understanding data and being able to learn from it. Um, what's your vision of clarity? Like what, 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 when you came in, what were you thinking of like, this is how all these departments need to work together. This is what it needs to look like. Like, what would you want to do there when you joined? Yeah, I think um, that's a good question. I think with any company, um, Clary is actually my my fourth um, SaaS startup. Um, and I think with any company, when you join, um, you know, your initial, your initial kind of 30 days or view is really, um, you know, really to get a good lay of the land, right? You sort of have a, you know, idea of what you think um, the, the structure should look like, and you kind of come in and you assess the current state, see where the gaps are. And then you start to kind of get to work on sort of the low hanging fruit and things that you need to fix and things that you want to enhance. Um, but I think, you know, ensuring that sort of that operational cadence, um, making sure that, you know, all the different departments are talking the same language, that we're all aligned to the same metrics, um, that we're all looking at the same data and we're looking at the same way. Those type of things are sort of the fundamentals and basics, um, as well as making sure, to your point around systems, is making sure all the systems are talking to each other and talking the same language as well. Can we can we jump into, like, what some of those things are? Like, what are some things that um, you measure and care about? You know what I mean? Like, I, I think one that we obviously in the marketing front, we'll talk about is customer acquisition cost, lifetime value of a customer. We look at those two things. And if it's lopsided, you know, I go have a good cry in the shower. Um, but if they're not like, what, what, what do you do? Like, what's your, what's your play? What are you yeah, looking I'm, at for metrics? Yeah. I mean, I think the metrics are obviously always aligned with sort of your company goals. Right. And I think every company, um, depending on what those objectives are, I think there's some of those basics are obviously bringing in new customers, right? You're looking at leads, the quality of the leads. We talk a lot about MQLs and SQLs and all of that, but really the quality of bringing in um, opportunities, right? New leads for potential opportunities. Um, So looking at, you know, what your pipeline looks like, looking at what your conversion rate looks like, looking at, you know, your, your 
deal size, average deal cycle, sort of the basics, I think, um, for every company, um, looking at your, obviously, ARR and um, looking at your um, growth potential, looking at your upsells, look at your renewals, look at churn. There's, I think there's a ton of different metrics, you know, I could probably list maybe like 30 or 40 off the top of my head. But I think the big ones are obviously bring, you know, a lot of times for growth, high growth companies are bringing in that new customers and keeping them. Right. And you're trying to sort of expand within those, that customer base. When, when there's problems with um, things like churn or close rates or marketing and stuff, is it revenue ops's job to identify the problem or is it revenue ops's job to try and fix the problem too? Like what usually, what's your play if you see something happening in one of those? Because yeah. that's the really hard part. It's such a domino effect. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. So I think that's a great, that's a great point because I think that's where operations plays a lot of the value is around the insights, right? We're the closest to the system. We're the closest to the data. Um, we're often the closest to the day-to-day, literally the operations on what's happening and have a pulse on the business. Um, you know, so I think operations is the perfect candidate to be the person who is seeing ahead, right? Being proactive and being able to see around those corners and say, hey, here's what the data is telling me. These are the trends I'm seeing. Hey, these are the business decisions we should be looking at and bubble those bubble those insights and analysis up to, you know, up to the CRO or up to your leadership team or your CMO. And um, not only bubble up the insights, but I think what is the story? You know, what's what's the data telling us and what are the recommendations in terms of what we should do to pivot? Because at the end of the day, the operations team is also going to be the ones that will actually go and execute. If we decide to make a change in our, you know, go to market, like this is a perfect year, right? The 2020 to, um, to really illustrate how, how companies have had to pivot. Right? If you think about beginning of the year, everyone rolled out their plans. Everyone thought, hey, you know, here's all this growth we're going to do and all these things we're going to do. And then pandemic hits and everybody had to, you know, quickly shift. And many people, many companies had to change their operating plan. They might have changed some of their go-to-market motion. And operations is really the folks who are going to go execute on that. So there's a question from the audience, from Maya. She goes, what are the top skills that you need to, all right, what are the top skills needed to be addressed to be an outstanding RevOps from your perspective and from your great experience? Oh, I just wrote a blog about this, the top 12 skills, (laughs) Uh, which I can definitely share after this. Um, You just read an audiobook version of it? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What we could do is just read it word for word. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, there is a, I went through it, so I did my, just my perspective on the top 12. I'm sure there are others, but I mean, I think, um, you know, some of the, there's, Operations is so broad that I think that the ex- expertise and experience that you need to kind of bring to the table can vary, right? If you're focused on different areas of operations, whether that's the strategy or the data, you know, analytics, comp, forecasting, um, deals desk, right? There's so many different areas. Um, but I, but uh, what I actually was writing about was more around the characteristics because I think you sort of know if you're an operate if you have an operational mindset right you're one of those people who immediately when you think about you know there's we say hey there here's this high level goal that we want to um that we want to achieve and then your brain immediately starts to break that objective into sort of these digestible pieces of how do you actually go to execute right and i think that operational mindset is also one that you're constantly looking to sort of make sense of the chaos, right? You're looking at things and immediately thinking of how do I, how do I structure this? How do I build some process around this? So, you know, what's the best way for me to, um, to build some structure so that it can be scalable, that it can be repeatable. Um, so I think there's a number of those things also. I, one of the biggest things I think that we'll, you'll hear a lot around operations folks, especially in small companies, because sometimes you are a team of one, or you may have a really small team of just a couple of people is you have to be able to, um, you know, really be able to pivot from being strategic to tactical very quickly. Um, sometimes, you know, same day, same hour could be, you know, and I think I even wrote this in the blog, same, same meeting, right. That you're, you know, kind of that example of here, I'm thinking about what do I need to do for the business? Very strategic. And then go and actually, how do I go and execute on this? Right. And so very tactical as well. I I got a question. You can't get mad. Can we do, can we do a little game with you? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) All right. We're going to put it. It's totally cool. Everyone that's watching, 
not in the hot box. Had no idea about this. We're just kind of doing this because <laughs> I, I want to kind of play through this. Sure. Let's go through hypotheticals and find out how your mind works and like what you would do. Is that cool? Like for yeah. tactic, like taking a strategic problem and moving into some tactics. Would that be cool? Like what sure. things you would look at from a rev ops? Is that too much on the spot or can we try it? No, no. I'm All totally right, so game. Let's pretend that uh, I'm Rishi and I work in the marketing team at Lead IQ and our MQLs aren't converting very well. Um, so we get a lot of people. I'm, this is a fake situation, everyone that's listening. <laughs> You're going to call a fake person. There is nobody Listen. named Rishi in marketing. He doesn't You're going to convert. <laughs> and all, gonna convert. Of your, all of your leads convert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100% convert. conversion. You're all going to get demos, obviously. No, anyway, anyway. Um, <laughs> so let's pretend that um, I do a webinar. I have 500 signups and I've done a couple. Of, I have great attendees for these webinars over and over again, but they don't really turn into, oper- uh, they don't really turn into opportunities. Um, in this scenario, there's... Uh, the leads are handed off to the sales development team. Um, Mm -hmm. The data we're pulling comes from Salesforce um, with campaign member. Is this cool? Is it too tactical or is this good? No, I'm Um, I'm following. Okay. So that's the data you have. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Like, what do you start looking at? What other stuff do you look at to figure out and diagnose the problem? Yeah. You know, you're like hitting on all the things. I don't know if you've been reading my content or what. (laughs) You've done some research. You've done some research. My blog, because I literally, before the 12 characteristics, was a lead scoring model. (laughs) But um, yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, you work so hard, right? Marketing works so hard to generate awareness, generate, you know, interest, drive traffic to the website, right? Um, So all these different things. And then you bring in these leads, right? And I think, uh, we fail to sometimes um, ensure that we're getting quality leads, right? You talked about data, right? So I think lead scoring is obviously a huge piece of that, right? You want to get the right leads to the right people at the right time. So, you know, depending on your business model, you know, what your ICP looks like, right? Who who are, um, who are the target personas that you're selling to? Who are the target accounts Right. So you can go through and rate those. And I'm sure you, b- both of you being in marketing, you're very familiar with scoring, but obviously you want to score the leads and get the right, get the best leads into the hands of your sellers. Do you right? think uh, to, I'm going to, I don't want to lose steam. So don't forget what you're going to say, but I would just want to ask a question on that. Yeah. Um, do you think RevOps should be the ones that are coming up with what a good lead is, or is it something you collaborate with every team or like how, like, What's that criteria like? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing about operations is we're obviously partnering very closely with all of the revenue teams, right? You're working with your demand gen team, your growth team, you know, your CMO, your VP of marketing, and you're working with sort of those experts in their field. Um, and then you're enabling them, right? You're really helping them uh, make better decisions with the data, with the insights, and then you're enabling them through tools and process. Um, so to answer your question, it's, obvi- it's definitely a joint effort. I think yep. you're always need to be very closely partnered with the folks who understand the business. Um, but you also need to understand the business, right? Um, so if you think about sort of that lead scoring model, you are working with your marketing team, right? You are working with your sales team because you also want to see, hey, leads that did go to an SDR that you thought were good because you're constantly revamping your lead scoring as yep. well, right? As your business evolves. So, so uh, oh, go ahead, Rishi. Yeah. So actually there was something in the chat where Lydia brought up and mm-hmm. she disagreed with you something that she wants to kind of get addressed. So yeah. she basically states sales is definitely important in startups as well as every other company, but you can't discount marketing and definitely can't discount Absolutely. customer attention. Yeah. Churn is a major problem in startups and investors scrutinize that. So I also believe that early stage companies have to build with coordinated rev ops perspective is essential to real lasting success. Yeah, so, no, I, 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 I definitely agree with that. I think my comment was more around if you had your first hire and you're like series A, or maybe you're just seated and you're, you just got seed funding and you're trying to expand now, where do most people hire first? Um, and I think that was sort of that question around, you know, how do I build out a sales ops or how do I build up a rev ops team? Um, and I think um, I do agree, obviously churn is huge and um, being, um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing this rise of RevOps overall, right? Is recognizing that marketing sales, you know, customer success, all of the different teams need to work together. I think my answer was more around, hey, if you're hiring for one role, it's going to depend on where your, your selling motion, what sa- size and stage your company is at, and sort of where do you need the most power, if you will, or most lift. And I think my comment was more 
oftentimes you're going to see, hey, I need, because I may not have any customers yet. You don't need to worry about churn yet because you don't have a customer. Um, and then also you may not be investing as much in, um, in inbound or generation of, you know, um, marketing campaigns yet in a very early startup where you may not even have any marketing people. You may just have your CEO and maybe one salesperson. Or you, um, haven't, been, or you haven't been around long enough to have churn. <laughs> like, yeah, you may not have customers yet. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and I guess to add to Lydia's point, because I do agree that it's important um, to obviously don't, don't, uh, you know, don't downplay the importance of marketing or customer success. Obviously it's critical to the business. Um, but I think early, early stages when you're just starting to acquire your first, you know, handful of customers um, and you start to want to build that engine around, okay, I closed, you know, I was able to win five customers. How do I scale that process that wins and converts customers, uh, converts prospects to customers? That's where, you know, you're probably going to focus first and then start to sort of branch out, you know, top branch out bef before sales and after sales, post sales, pre-sales and post sales. So to, to circle back to a uh, great answer, by the way, to circle back to like this, the situation with like the kind of putting in the hot seat a little bit with some of these questions and stuff. Yeah. Um, I, we will call it a game, I guess. Um, sure. So we're earlier, you're mentioning the importance of lead scoring. You said it's a collaborative effort. You need to like work with other departments on this stuff. Um, I think for input, right. For yeah, the, yeah. for knowledge, but obviously you want to see the data, right. Is what really is what's really happening. Right. Are we really converting yeah, more so, in yeah, different areas? Here's what I was wondering. So a lot of people, it, it's, makes a ton of sense to look at the data and stuff. What if you're a company, you don't have that data, right? How do you, so you have to build stuff to collect that data? Or like, what do you, what do you do in your case? Like, let's go through the MQL example still like webinar, lots of attendees, not turning into demo accounts afterward. Um, you're looking obviously at how great were the leads that came in. There's obviously other things that could impact why they turned into demos or why they didn't, right. but um, you, you have to have data on that. Um, what do you do? Like, what's the play there? Yeah. So I think, I mean, in your example of the webinar, I mean, you were obviously looking at who attended, right? What, what, what were their roles? What were their levels? You know, are they the right personas um, yeah. that you're attracting to attend the webinar? Are they the right level, right? Because you also see that in different companies, depending on the technology that you're selling, whether you need to, you know, can you sell to a manager level or do you need to sell to a director? Do you need buy-in from your C-level? Um, you know, so you're, targeting the right level of champion and sort of uh, persona. Um, and then you're also looking at sort of the makeup of the people um, that are coming from you know, the, the company makeup as well, right? Are you attracting the right industries, the right, uh, the right um, companies with the right size, the right background? We talked to someone yesterday uh, when we did our other webinar um, and they mentioned they're actually getting away from, oh, you know what? It wasn't during the other webinar. It was just a private meeting that I just disclosed everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> you actually well, you you say that. No one you, ever you know known. the person. You know the person really well that uh, I talked to. I'll tell you about it after. But um, um, what I was, <laughs> that's really funny. Me or everyone on the call? <laughs> no, no. You, you He's going to go to each individual person and say, they, hey, this is who it was. <laughs> yeah, they, I, I, was, I was getting advice from them and I talked to them about this. Um, Got so, it. Um, they're actually moving away from looking at actions that a prospect took mm -hmm. as part of like that lead scoring process and only looking at static things like company size, persona, uh, region, uh, yeah. industry, things like that. Do you kind of feel like that's where it's heading next year where actions are less important? I don't think so. Um, you know, I mean, I don't have any empirical data to say yes or no, but my, but I don't, I believe that, you know, the data element of, you know, the company, the person, you know, what they do, where they work, that's obviously a big piece of it, but then also the intent and sort of the timing, mm -hmm. I think is driven by that activity, right? If I'm downloading your, you know, an ebook, I'm attending your webinar, if I'm showing interest, um, I think that drives a lot of the intent, which helps, um, prioritize leads in terms of timing, right? Because I may be the right persona. I might be the right person. You know that I need your product, but I don't need it now, right? But if I'm attending your webinars, I'm, you know, downloading your content and I'm talking to you, you know, your teams or whatever I'm doing in terms of activity that tells me that, Hey, there's interest now. Cool. So how do you structure a handoff to, of leads to the sales team? 
Yep. So through, so obviously through the lead scoring, um, we obviously look at, you know, MQLs. Um, we route, we have an SDR team, a fantastic rev dev team. Um, shout out to them because they are <laughs> amazing at the company I, I work for at Clary. Um, Will they be but, able to do our stuff for us too? Are you sharing? <laughs> yeah, we'll share some best practices around how <laughs> to get. This is outreach. hypothetical, Rishi. Hypothetical. We don't this is all problem. hypothetical. Right, right, right. You, you yeah. don't have a problem with this. R so, Rishi um, is not the problem. What? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Sorry, yeah, no, definitely. So I think it's, our, our process is pretty standard around lead scoring, you know, making sure that we get the right leads to the right um, folks and, you know, based upon where the account is held. It's pretty. It's pretty how, straightforward. How automated do you do it? Is it is it just gets in the Salesforce campaign list member, or is it something where it's like literally gets put into a cadence or sequence automatically? Like what what's if you don't mind us asking? Like I just kind yeah. of understand that. yeah. So I've kind of done it both ways. Um, different companies we have had where they, they it creates an activity you know through our lead routing um, platform. It creates an activity for an SDR to go and work right. It basically an activity or a task. In Salesforce, um, we've also had where um, we've uh, done some integration in terms of the lead will drop right into a sequence or a cadence, depending on which platform you use, yep. um, and then they can start working it from there. I think you know, from an ops perspective and data quality, oftentimes we, you know, as long as all your systems are talking to each other and you keep things in sync. I don't know if you can, I hope you don't mind these questions. I just think it's kind of yeah, great to no, like scrape into strategies and tactics for this stuff together. Um, yep. If we're going through that same example, leads come in as webinars, get handed off to the sales team through some sort of automation thing. Um, what do you, uh, how do you know which number is actually causing what? Because like, is it, what if the response rate is low on the sales side, on the marketing side, the lead scores are bad. Like, is it, is it, which one do you like it as a analytical mind like yours? What are you looking at to be like, I found the problem. This is what it is. Marketing Rishi, get better leads. At the, <laughs> Rishi, get better leads with this webinar or get better leads at the webinar or, or sales. We need to work on this cadence or sequence. It's not very effective. Like how do you figure out what, which one's causing what sort of. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question, but I mean, I think it's the data doesn't lie. Um, Right. There's, but so I guess I could just say two things. The data doesn't lie, but the interpretation of the data can be, you know, can be bias. Right. Um, so I think, um, you know, in your example of where do I look, you need to look at both, right. You need to look at sort of the entire sort of the flow, yep. um, you know, because you always want to go back and say, Hey, all of these MQLs that we thought were good, none of them converted, or these didn't convert and sort of understand the patterns, um, of, you know, what's consistent across those that we could be doing better. All right. Uh, let's, if we're doing another example of this, what about middle of the funnel stuff? So let's say I'm sales, I'm working an enterprise deal. I've got mm -hmm. a ton of seats and a ton of people from a company that are using stuff. How do you get the operationalization of that to fit with the CSM team, marketing? Um, maybe you have a sales engineer or solutions architect or something like that on, in your role. Like, what's that process built up from? Because this is what's one of the most complicated things about your role and your job is like, you literally have to touch every department and figure this out. And um, how do you navigate it? Like, what's the priority on that? Um, are you asking about segmentation around sort of enterprise um, I, or? I think I'm more asking about, um, so something's already an opportunity. Um, what's, what's the priority? Is it like, do you try and do you spend time and effort on getting that working with marketing better so that those people know what's going on with marketing activities? Do you spend more effort getting the CSM team enabled so that they can work that, uh, opportunity and make sure that they're transitioned perfectly when they get closed? Like what's the priority on it? Yeah, I guess, um, I guess the answer is sort of all of the above, um, right? Because I think you've got to, you know, part of the sort of that revenue engine piece of it is really making sure that all of the different areas of your engine are fine-tuned, right? And working together. I think yeah. that's the real key um, that I think a lot of companies struggle with is making sure that everybody's talking the same language. You know, we're all kind of uh, marching to the same beat, I guess, if you will. Yeah. The great answer, by the way, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, 
I think as people are planning for 2021, our 2019 plans got completely ruined. Like everything we made for 2020 got ruined that we made last year around this time because turns out COVID happened and a lot of things yeah. changed and we had to adjust and stuff. Um, as you're planning stuff for next year, what, what are you focusing on? Like, what's the, what, how do you, let's say you have infrastructure in place. Query is really operationalized and everything's great. You can't just like say, be complacent, like, Hey, everything's great. Like you have to do stuff to improve. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for that you think teams need to focus on this year in revenue operations? Yeah. I mean, I think depending on your business, obviously we're focused on growth, you know, continued continuing to grow um, because we are a smaller company. We're obviously high growth in a high growth market. Um, so we are looking for, you know, continuing, I guess, in any company, really looking for ways to continue your growth, minimize churn, right? C increase your net retention rates. I'm um, in a SaaS business, obviously keeping the value, you know, looking for more value drivers to keep our customers happy and help them be successful. Um, and then you're always looking for more marketing, right? Looking for more in inbound, right? How do we generate more awareness and expand our TAM? All right, because when we look at our attempts, like how do we penetrate more of it, right? We we do a great assessment of, you know, kind of what is our overall TAM, but then how do we, what are the right activities we should be doing and strategies in order to start to penetrate more of that TAM and have a bigger outreach? I got a question. So what technologies are tickling your interest right now for helping each department get better for like sales off marketing? Like what is helping create a better for vision and alignment both? Like what technology would you recommend? Well, first you've got to buy Clary. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> that was a too easy plug. It um, was also fact, lead IQ. Don't forget that people. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely with, with, um, you know, and, and I think I mentioned to you guys before we sort of started the webinar was that, you know, I joined Clary earlier this year, but prior to that, I was a huge champion, you know, two-time customer. Um, I had Clary at a prior company and then joining us, my next company as you brought Clary was like the first tool I wanted to bring on, um, bring on board for our, our leadership team. And it's interesting because, you know, coming into a company with sort of an understanding of the platform and being a champion, but then coming in, you always know you know, it's similar probably to Lead IQ is how you use Lead IQ is much better than anybody else has probably used it, right? And so when I came in and saw Clary, I'm like, wow, you know, my Clary never looked like this. You know, Clary on Clary is amazing, um, which by the way, I guess, shameless plug, um, you know, obviously if anybody who's interested in, interested in learning more, I'm happy to have that discussion. Um, but I think really, um, you know, that's a big one. I think there's so many great you know, so many really, really great tools out there. Um, as I think we were talking about earlier too, around the tech stack has just exploded, right? For revenue, there's everything for for sales and marketing CS leaders to, um, you know, to use. But I think, you know, making sure that you, I think more importantly than the tools that you're using or specific names of the vendors is that you want to be able to look at your tech stack holistically and ensure that, you know, all the systems are talking to each other. Right, the data is flowing um, seamlessly through the various systems because I think that's one of the biggest um, challenges from an ops perspective and from a just a company perspective is when your systems don't talk to each other, right? Where you're, where you have a system, you have great information there, but it doesn't translate downstream. And your, you know, the worst nightmare is like to export data from a system and then input it somewhere else, right? You want all the tools to be integrated and speak to each other. Cool. And then I see a question which says. Are the benefits of RevOps more in tactics or strategy? Wow, that's a good one. Um, I think it's, you know, I think a lot of us in in smaller companies, and this is something I've been on my soapbox about a lot this year, is around trying to get out of the, you know, trying to become more strategic. It's really difficult um, when you are like a one person show or you just have, you know, a handful of uh, people on your team to, you know, kind of raise your head up and get out of the tactical, right? But I think there's a lot of steps that you can do, um, you know, small steps that every time you're doing a task, for example, that may seem tactical is to put that strategic lens upon it, right? Like we talked about sort of the MQL process or some of the, you know, when you're looking at, you're discovering, hey, my, you know, my conversion rate doesn't look as good as it should, then you are digging into the data and that's very tactical. Right. But then when you're bubbling up the insights and coming up, you know, working collaboratively with your marketing team and coming up with a recommendation on how to proceed, that's more strategic. Right. So I think not pulling a report, 
but providing insights and help, I guess, help make data, data driven decisions is the strategic part. So I guess to answer your question, the value is both. I think, I think once, I think, um, obviously the tactical has to get done and that's an important piece of it. But I think the real value, I guess, is really that strategic, you know, becoming a strategic business partner and really help driving, um, help drive the business. So uh, do you think on the revenue ops side, um, you mentioned there's lots of technology to enable you to collect data. Um, does revenue ops or should revenue ops care about productivity? Like, is that something that absolutely. is a problem or is that more sales operations? No, absolutely. That's all part of um, the operational piece of it, right? It's being effective, helping things be more efficient and then help things be repeatable, right? And scalable. Um, so yeah, definitely efficiency is a huge part of that because you're, you know, part of it bringing in tools is to drive efficiency, right? Less clicks, less steps, automation, integration. Um, and so I think efficiency is a big piece of it, which kind of goes back to when we were talking about bringing in somebody new, um, bringing an ops person to start to build a lot of that infrastructure, because part of that engine is to make it run more efficiently, right? Looking at what works really well um, and making that repeatable. Should, should revenue operations also have a hand in like the sales enablement part of training people how to use those processes? Is that like a yeah. big part of it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think for most of my, um, most of my roles, I've always had enablement as part of the operations function. Um, I have also seen it as a separate, you know, function reporting directly into like a CRO, um, regardless of sort of what that, uh, organizational structure looks like there's, you know, there's a very tight alignment between ops and enablement. Um, personally, my perspective is I like to have enablement as part of ops because I think you know operations builds all this process and cadence and such, and then enablement helps to um, train and the team sort of works hand in hand in terms of setting the right metrics for productivity, for you know ramp time, for all these different things for a rep, um, and they sort of partner with the enablement to deliver the right training. Is that part of uh, strategy too? I know it's tactical, like, hey, what vendors do we get to make someone productive? But do you think about like, my vision is a rep goes in, finds a prospect and does something in one click. My, yep. my, 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 like, is that a dream vision or is that stuff that you actually like no, that's reverse actually, engineer? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a huge part of the operations piece is to enable your sellers, right? And enable your marketing team. So, you know, as we talked about sort of that engine, it is enabling them to be able to do their jobs better and more effectively, right? Which goes back to sort of the, the good leads, the good opportunities, the good ICP. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a great point. Um, on the marketing front, um, obviously attribution is a big topic right now. A lot of people are talking about trying to get better attribution about like what gets credit, what impact did this have? Do you think one thing I've heard uh, from talking to some people at other companies about this a little bit is uh, there's kind of this weird mesh right now of what impact prospectors have on attribution and figuring out a way to get it so that if a sales development rep is emailing or cold calling an account and that account comes to the website eventually and fills out a form, you want to find a way to cross-reference that credit and attribute that those touches might have had an impact on revenue. Um, is that something you're thinking about too? And is that something that you do at Clary or is it yeah, Something so the, the beauty of that is that for Clary, we actually don't um, consider, is it marketing or sales? We're all the revenue team. So um, so we don't have that problem, which I think you'll see more and more as you move to more of a revenue model versus a sales versus marketing. Um, you sort of remove those, you know, those kind of finger pointing or those kind of silos from that equation. So there's a question that came from Maya and what about deal desk and business analyst? Is it also should be, should E be under the rev ops? Yeah. So I'm used to deals desk being part of operations. Um, you know, I think we're the closest to the business closest to our sellers. Um, I have seen hybrid where, you know, uh, deals desk might sit in finance or maybe a piece of it sits in finance, you know, maybe the deal structuring and sort of deal engagement and, you know, working with the reps, um, is more on the op side. And then maybe the booking desk, if you will, like a check, you know, kind of where they're actually looking for, um, you know, kind of the T's and C's, the final, I guess, crossing the, uh, what did they say? Crossing the T's and dotting the I's, that piece of it is more on the finance side and making sure that you can rev rack something. Um, but yeah, I'm used to Dale's sitting in operations. I think it, 
uh, you know, there's a natural synergy, I think, there. Cool. So I just want to let everyone know we have about five to six minutes left of this interview. Um, and actually, there is a question that did come in. What's your blog address? They oh. want to know that right away. So if you could give that out, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. The people exactly. give the people what they want. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a last call for questions. If you have anything, please put in the Q and A or the chat. We'll get to them right away. So what one area I wanted to ask? Um, hopefully, I, if you're looking for your blog right now, um, I feel bad. We can we can. I am. Solve. I'll find it. I'll I'll make a long winded question. Um, I actually was looking forward to earlier when you were talking about it, and I was trying to type it, but I couldn't find it. Um. Actually, I'll ask you a question, Rishi. Go As a marketer. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like our team is productive or do you think we could be more productive? And uh, I want to ask that and then I'll follow up with a question for Roslyn while she's looking for the blog. <laughs> wow. What a loaded question for the sake of not internal purposes. We're so productive. We're the most productive team I've been <laughs> in for internal purposes. Uh, we could be better. Um, no, I think that um, we have a lot of attributes, right? Like we pump out a lot of content. Our content's great. If it's a brand, um, I think the one attribute that we could benefit from a lot is organization. So that's, an honest answer. There you go. Yeah. So perfect setup for this. Um, <laughs> how do we get more organized as a marketing team? We're not like, we're all kind of right brained, create creative people. Um, what's like, what can we do as a, what do you do at Clary to keep the marketing team organized as opposed to like having it be anarchy and chaos? Yeah. Do you have an operations team? Yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. But okay. the, um, I will note on the operations team, um, we just did a, we finally just finally did a demand gen hire. So like a lot of the stuff we've been doing has been not heavy on the demand gen side. It's like, we do webinars and stuff, but it's yeah. marketing doing it. Now we're having demand gen sink their teeth in. We finally set up some attribution models and stuff to track like where revenue is coming from. I think the data collection part has gotten a lot better the past couple months. Mm -hmm. um, but as we're transitioning, a big part of 2021 is going to be getting more structured, getting more organized. It's honestly, um, the comparison that I have is it's almost like, we run like a late night television show and like have to do a show every day. And mm -hmm. as a result, it's kind of just like, we're not thinking about what's next week or the week after a lot of the time. Um, yeah. So what, what do you, how do you, how does your team get uh, organized, especially if you have disorganized people on it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think you just set up a perfect scenario for why you need operations, right? It's exactly that, that that analogy around the doing the late night show every day and just kind of trying to get through the day and get through the business um, piece of it and not having time to be proactive and stepping back um, to sort of build. I think that is where your operations person comes in, right? Because then they start to look at how you're running your business and start to build some process and structure around that um, and to start to, you know, be able to, build a repeatable, um, you know, uh, build a repeatable kind of reliable uh, process. And then obviously in startups, as you, see, you all know, it's all iterative, right? You're building something for today, knowing that it's going to continue to evolve um, over time. Cool. So, so we have a question from yeah. the, uh, this is anonymous, but should SDRs report to marketing or sales? Yeah, that's a good question too. I've seen I've seen both. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's a big debate. Um, you know, I think that's kind of like the less, I guess, more so than the deals desk or the enablement sitting in ops. <laughs> but um, I guess for me, from what I've seen in just my past and different companies is depends on what your development rep is doing, right? Are they just generating are they generating interest or are they qualifying and starting kind of doing some discovery? Right? I think it's sort of that roles and responsibilities is, you know, it's very, uh, you know, I think that the team can sit in either, either group. Um, I've seen it both like at Clary, they sit sort of in this, they sit in sales, but it's kind of a hybrid role. Um, but in prior companies, you know, my last two companies ago, they sat in marketing. So I think it's less about kind of where they sit and what they, but more about what they do, right? If they're generating awareness and bringing, tra uh, bringing, um, you know, driving attendance to webinars and that type of thing, I think that's probably more of a marketing type of function versus if they're really getting into qualification, um, starting to do some discovery, you know, aligning with your, you know, your various use cases that might be a little bit more salesy. So we, we talked about, uh, prior to the webinar actually happening, tackling some stuff about the customer journey too and thinking about the customer in that end. When you're planning out 
that part of the equation, not just like making it operationalized so that you're having a fast response, fine text, you can measure what's actually happening with the customer. Do you, do you as a RevOps team, is it, should RevOps be mapping out what the customer is going through? Uh, or is that something that's more of what's happening internally and let the, each team respectively figure that out? No, I think that's a, that's a good, uh, I think that's a great point because I think operations is responsible for that, especially for if you have a RevOps team, um, is really mapping that customer journey. What does it look like from a buyer's perspective, right, externally? Um, because I think that is one of the the biggest, I guess, um, values as well of having this RevOps and kind of breaking down those silos is really yeah. creating this kind of frictionless process, right, for a buyer. So, um could we, for example, um, what's the customer journey like at Clary? Like, I know it, you've been in many companies, but most recently, like, what's that journey look like for you in the picture you're trying to paint? Because you came in with like a canvas to try and paint it. Yeah, yeah. I think for um, for us, um, you know, externally, I guess the the main goal is from an external perspective that you know your your prospect doesn't care or doesn't know about they're being handed off from one department to another, right? Your internal handoffs, for them, it should be a seamless experience, right? Internally, we're saying, oh, okay, now you're you're you know in marketing and then you get handed to an SDR, then you get handed to your AE, then you go to your, you know, your AM and then you have a CSM um, or your implementation team and then your CSM. But from a buyer's perspective, they don't know about your internal handoffs. And I guess the goal is that they don't feel like they're being handed off. Right. I think the, the goal is to map a journey that for them seems very seamless. It's very flawless. They're not repeating anything. Everybody within the Clary as a face um, for the company, we all understand their business and understand the value that they're trying to, you know, what they're trying to achieve. What's the best way to do that? Just to over communicate what's going to happen with the person as they're going through it, or is it and not overlapping? Are those kind of the basic two foundations of that? Yeah, I think that a uh, couple things. One, I think it's really clear roles and responsibilities, right? Sort of your rules of engagement on who's doing what and what role each person, each um, team plays, and then making sure that the information around the customer and what's happening with them, you know, what's you know, some of those KPIs that we were talking about, the values, drivers, why they buy, all of the different, I guess, intel around the customer um, is kept in in a place where everyone has access to it. Right. And everybody's kind of aligned and on the same page. And the direction that people are heading in with this journey is obviously more account based too, right? It's not just working with one person. It's figuring out how to infiltrate the other parts of your buyer personas when you're closing, right? That's right. Yeah. And especially I think I've I think most of us have seen for this year that your, you know, your CFO and your finance team are more and more important in your buying cycle, right? As budgets are getting tightened or even just, you know, shut down, right? Closed off this year with the pandemic. I think one thing no one's talking about really, and, and if you're listening to this and you're thinking about like, what do I do in RevOps next year? What should I do? You're also dealing with a situation where side conversations are dead. Like we used to be like it, when, if you were most of your companies you would sell to would be in an office. And if I got on a call with Clary about trying to fix stuff in my pipeline and understanding everything, I'm not going to go over to the marketing department and talk to the person because I bumped into them in the kitchen and said, Hey, this happened. That's those funny. conversations kind of die now. Right. So you have to right. like figure out how to pull in those people and have them understand the buying process and include more people so that you can increase your deal value. Yep. That's right. Yep. I think, I think um, in selling, I mean, even before the pandemic, right, you sort of understand the value of having multiple touch points within the company, right? Not just have a single point of, um, could potentially be a single point of failure, right? We talk a lot about building surround sound, right? Making sure that you have multiple champions and co the company, you know, you have buy-in from different, uh, different collaborators and different champions within the company. I kind of wish we knew you were going to say surround sound because then all of us could have said it at the same time and whoever's <laughs> listening with headphones would hear it in surround sound, but it's okay. <laughs> we can try that in the future. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it's what I was thinking of. Um, Ryan, I, you should have known. We could try it again. Let's ask that question again. And right at the moment, let's do it. <laughs> no, it's too hard to time. It's too hard to time. It can't be done, Rishi. Um, one, one thing I've actually been thinking about a little bit um, that's outside the box, and I'd love to get your opinion on it before we wrap up. Um, I've been thinking about, because those side conversations are done, maybe it's not a bad idea to have a sales development rep or a portion of your team 
just filling up those other buckets that you have on that account you're working. Um, or maybe it's the AE doing it and stuff. Almost like even though you have an opportunity, you still have to do some outbounding a little bit with the other members of the team. Yep. Um, is that something you've thought about for the upcoming year and like how to, how to build something where there's a function like that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things I think we do really well um, at Clary is around the relationship building and building that surround sound, right? And I think um, because we are a platform that touches multiple groups, um, it's sort of an easy, you know, it's easy discussion, right? Versus you may be only selling to, if you're a platform that only sends, sells to marketing, right? Versus we're selling kind of to the entire revenue platform and to finance as well, right? Because there's value to all of the different um teams. So it's probably easier to, there's more points of entry, I guess, in terms of working with um, different people and different personas within the company. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think the more, the more um, sort of team selling that you do, I think the more successful we'll be for next year and beyond. Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously everyone, we're coming up at time. Uh, Rishi's mentioned the last call for questions if you want to add anything else. Uh, Rishi, do you have anything you want to ask for closing thoughts? Yeah, actually, I have one last question. And it goes, how should managers think about cross-functional team alignment and how would this affect the customer experience? Um, Is what's, that, the, what's the question, Rishi? So it's about how managers should think about, like how should managers in different departments align themselves and how should that be thought about? How do you yeah. actually create alignment? Is that kind of Basically. what you're asking? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of the same. Um, that's probably along the same lines as kind of what we've been talking about around rev revenue operations, right? Because I mean, RevOps is a piece of that, but your, you know, your sales leader, your marketing leader, um, your customer leader, you know, whether that's a CCO or whatever role that is, um, I think they all need to be aligned as well. Um, operations is sort of the infrastructure to help pull that together, but they obviously need to be aligned and marching to the same drum as well, right? Have shared goals. I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, should marketing have a revenue goal, right? Should customer success have a revenue goal? And maybe should your sales leader have a net retention goal, right? And just sort of, I think all of those concepts around building um, shared goals and objectives is just to sort of build that alignment across the different teams. Are you using OKRs or something like that? Is that like how you guys set up your goals? Yeah, I think most companies are using, you know, like some type of either OKR, KPIs, or, you know, basically just goals for the company. For the people that are wondering what those are, do a little Google search, OKR <laughs> uh, and, and KPI. They're cool acronyms, but they, they actually really do help a lot with getting everyone lined up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, and keeping it simple. Yeah, Don't yeah, have like exactly. 50 of them. <laughs> Yeah. Pick a couple. That's it. Yeah. You don't have to read. Pick a couple big ones. Yeah. Not 50, but 25 is perfect. <laughs> Get out of here, Rishi. Get out of here. Don't you have, you, none of the leads are beginning or converting. What are you doing? <laughs> you need an but, OKR for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, last thoughts. We should probably wrap this up soon. So does anyone, Ryan want to start with last thoughts and we'll just go to Rosalind after. Yeah. I, I just want to say uh, thank you for being on. This has been really great information. Um, I need to work I, one thing I'm taking away from this is a leader of marketing here is I need to figure out a way to be more, a little bit more proactive with our revenue operations team. Usually it's me responding to things on Slack with like, what the hell's going on here and stuff like that <laughs> kind of sounds like I need to uh, be proactive in going to them for stuff and thinking about it as a resource, as opposed to like, oh man, more work for me to do. Like it's a, like, that's probably what I need to learn a big takeaway that I got from talking to you. Yeah, and I think along that point, you know, really looking at your ops team as sort of your your partner, right? As a as a partner and sort of an extension of your business, um, I think that's important for you to you know leverage leverage them and bring them into the fold, help them understand your business so that they can help to enable help to enable you and your team. Yep. Okay. So. This is like the PS part of the webinar where we <laughs> sign off, but we have another question asked. So there's one last question. Just wondering if implementing some agile approach to RevOps could be valuable. Yes, absolutely. Um, especially in a small company, like we were talking about sort of everything is iterative, right? I worked at a lot of mid-sized to large, you know, kind of public companies where, you know, we would have these huge waterfall type of projects. We'd have all this 
testing and roll, communication and training and rollout, um, where I learned very quickly at my first startup when we were about 100 people that that doesn't work because by the time you have designed that project plan, the business needs have already changed. So one thing I learned very quickly was you know needing to take sort of that agile iterative approach to um, to launching sort of small steps, right. And know that it's, it's a phased approach and know that it's going to be iterative. So, so is it, are 100%. You, do you, what, what do you guys do? Like sprints? Like, do you do like a one week sprint yeah, or two week sprint or something? Yeah, I think it's less official than that. Um, you know, I think about, you know, from a systems perspective, yes, you may be, you know, doing enhancements with your IT team. Um, if you have one, <laughs> if you're lucky enough to have one, um, or have a support. Um, but, you know, I think about even just process rollouts, right? When you're rolling out something to the sales team, you're doing it sort of iteratively, knowing that you're going to, um, you know, it, it could change, right? Quarter to quarter could change. It's not, you know, year to year, it, it will definitely change. Cool. Um, anything you want to promote or plug before we head out? Rosalind? Oh, for me? Um, yes. No, actually, you know, I just, you know, thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel a little bit like I'm interviewing for a job. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, not at all. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm I just hold kidding. a flashlight up. Where is she? <laughs> Where is she? Tell me about this. No, hey, one, one I, thing I just wanted to add to you, Rishi, yeah. we should have also, everyone, thank you for 10 bound for putting this together. 10 bound. Oh, was I was like, going to do that right after. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I just see, to coordinated that. efforts. Where's your ops person? <laughs> <laughs> we blew it. <laughs> no, but thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Just, you know, I, I more, every opportunity we have to sort of talk about the importance of revenue operations and the value and just sort of elevating the function as well as elevating the people. Um, you know, I'm all for it. I've been on this mission this year to do that. So I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for coming on. And I want to thank everyone else for attending. I want to thank David and Vivian from 10 bound for helping us put this together. And once again, Rosalind Santa Elena, <laughs> thank you so much for hopping on. We really appreciate it. Great. Thank you very much. Take it easy, everyone. All Take right. Care. Bye.